Good afternoon. Let's uh, get started. My name is uh, Christoph Charov. I'm one of the conference organizers. And uh, I have the privilege of introducing Marshall, who's been leading uh, panels on platforms and APIs for several years at the symposium, who is the foremost expert in this area. And uh, Marshall introduced the rest of the panel. Excellent. So, welcome, folks. It's a pleasure to have you here. I, I'll just stand up for a minute and give you a little bit of background. Uh, unfortunately, they didn't give us a slide uh, lecture, and so I can't actually show you the data and beautiful graphics we had. So I'm going to wave my hands, right? And hopefully, it'll be more than hand waving if we can actually give you some uh, data and some facts on it. I can give you so, an X and Y axis. I, I like this. So think of a point here, and we moved it over here. Sorry. Sorry. <laughs> You could already tell this is going to be a lively panel. So this is a uh, w welcome to what I think is going to be the really happening uh, panel for this afternoon. So um, we want to discuss APIs and API strategy and how this is actually improving organizations, how it's actually improving market cap, reducing expenditures, and improving productivity. I want to give you a simple set of data where we actually work with some of these organizations, particularly Apogee uh, and a little bit with MuleSoft. We're actually analyzed companies that were opening APIs, application programming interfaces, to see how did this correlate with their net income, with their sales, with their expenditures, with their changes in market capitalization. From a statistical point of view, the, real, the reason this is interesting is you can actually look at the pattern of behavior of the firm, then there's an event, which is the opening of the APIs for the first time, and then see what happens after. Do their sales change? Does their productivity rise? Does their market cap change? The punchline is, that it does. Uh, in fact, we actually found some very interesting results that the net income improves. Within a period, if we examine the statistical event of opening APIs, with a, with a period of six months, uh, these organizations sig experience significant gains in um, uh, productivity, in terms of uh, revenues, in terms of reduced costs. Uh, in fact, to give you some, uh, the punchline number on it, the average firm in our sample was about $2 billion firm, experienced a 4% gain in market capitalization, or $80 million. That is an extraordinary return on investment uh, if you're investing in API. So with that, um, we're actually now, see if we can actually have you learn from the folks that actually build these systems and put them together, so um, know more about that. So with that, uh, I'd like to introduce a couple of our panelists, have them say a few words about themselves. Um, in fact, uh, we can go from, from different ends uh, on this. Uh, some really interesting histories and lots of different cases. We can start with Dave Berlin, uh, who's CEO running Programmable Web, who's been writing on these things and actually has some of the world's best data on APIs. Um, Dave, want to say a word, introduce? Sure, thanks, Marshall. Um, so uh, I, I was originally a developer and, and uh, fell in love with APIs a very long time ago and started writing about them long before the API economy even got started. We're talking about like the days of, uh, now that we're in Cambridge, um, Novell, Lotus, and these guys, they actually had a bunch of API, messaging APIs. That's what got me interested. Um, I am the uh, editor-in-chief of Programmable Web. For those of you who not, are not familiar with it, uh, it's the uh, world's, uh, regarded as the world's journal of the API economy. So. Um, we, uh, we, we primarily satisfy four things. We, uh, we write about everything that's going on in the API economy from a news perspective on a daily basis. If you want to keep uh, caught up on it. We also run uh, the world's largest uh, directory of public APIs and related assets, such as SDKs. Uh, we uh, have a component of programmable web known as API University, where uh, tons of people come to learn everything there is to learn about APIs, uh, and we've been told that that they pretty much, a lot of people have told us that, that that's where they learned everything they know. Uh, and the fourth component is research. So because we run these databases and directories, we have a ton of data uh, that we can pour through and, uh, and spot interesting trends and patterns. And in some cases, uh, we share that information with other researchers uh, like Marshall. So. Uh, uh, I've been there for almost five years now. It was sort of the dream job for somebody who loved APIs to be asked to come run programmable web, so that's what I'm doing. That's pretty amazing. And actually, uh, some of the parent companies, MuleSoft, actually just acquired by Salesforce. Lots actually happening. Yes, yeah, so, uh, uh, MuleSoft really acquired program, programmable web, was founded in 2005, about the same time that the first web API showed up on the, on the internet. 
was a Google Maps and the Flickr API. Flickr just got acquired by um, Smug, Smug Hub, whatever it's called. And then um, it was originally part of Yahoo. Uh, anyway, so Programmable Web uh, was acquired once by uh, Alcatel Lucent uh, around the 2010 time frame. And, and uh, I think they woke up one morning and said, what are we doing with this? And, uh, and it was acquired by MuleSoft in 2013. But I've been given the, uh, the authority to run it with uh, relative autonomy so that uh, we can remain objective and independent in terms of our coverage. That's amazing. So after having been acquired twice, he's now going to be endowing drinks after the session. That's right. <laughs> so um, how many of you are familiar with DraftKings? <coughs> right. <laughs> so what's DraftKings do? Right. So I'm Travis Dunn. I'm the CTO at DraftKings. Uh, been there about four and a half years, just took over the role uh, a few months ago. Um, for us, API is a lot about how we reach our customers. Um, we're a, a sports entertainment brand uh, with 10 million customers worldwide. We're uh, available internationally um, with most of our, our presence here. Um, for us, uh, providing an API is key for keeping a tool ecosystem where people are doing research tools for looking up salary, uh, launching new devices and new applications all the time. Um, so as we're diversifying our product profile, like having core APIs that people understand has been huge for us. So um, yeah, thank you for having me. OK, it's a pleasure. And further introductions. Yeah, I'm Rudy Chang. Uh, I uh, recently joined an innovation consulting firm uh, called Discover Digital Group out of New York City. Uh, prior to that, that's just in the last two months, I spent the last four years at IBM uh, implementing and building out their marketing technology stack, the digital platform that runs IBM.com, <coughs> IBM's e-commerce, and uh, its partner ecosystem. And uh, so in terms of APIs, that was a big, uh, we had both kind of uh, internal and external um, use cases. Uh, but one of the things that I'm actually uh, working on with, uh, with, if anyone's familiar with the ever-increasing MarTech landscape slide, the, the Petri dish slide that just keeps multiplying logos, um, you know, one of the things that, uh, that we ha are, ha had been using uh, APIs for is to actually help create standardization of process because uh, there are so many choices to, in, the, in the market. Um, how do you kind of you know ride your horse on uh, pick a pick a horse and bet on it? Uh, so we'll talk a little bit later about that strategy. But that's so some of the we'd love to hear on. more about the the stacks, the internal versus external, the par building partner ecosystems around mm -hmm. that. That'd be really really interesting things to uh, to go to go for. Uh, on the end, um, Brian on uh, yeah. Apogee or Google, depending on which one you want to speak for. Yeah, yeah, I'll speak for both. Uh, so I. Uh, I am heavily mic'd. Um, uh, <laughs> uh, I am not Sam Ramsey. Uh, Sam Ramsey is my boss, so he is Vice President of Product Management for Developer Tools at Google. Uh, I lead research and strategy for Sam and our wonderful engineering partner, uh, Melody McFessel, whose team builds all the developer tooling for Google's engineers. Um, and increasingly, I'm spending a lot of our, my, my time figuring out how we bring that out to uh, external developers. So previously, I was at Apogee. Um, there's a pattern here. Google acquired Apogee in uh, 2016. Um, at Apogee, I had the privilege of working with Marshall on some of the research he mentioned, um, and uh, previously worked in uh, open source strategy at Microsoft uh, back about 10 years ago. So that was well before the CEO was on stage saying that uh, Microsoft loves Linux. But uh, that was <laughs> we, yes. we were putting the pieces in place about a decade ago, so it came, it came to fruition. So also being having been twice acquired, you can get the cocktails after this drink sponsored by David's <laughs> firm. So we can all go into those. Well, let's start with a couple of different. Um, so I want to start with a couple of questions here, and then I want to invite the audience to take um, to offer questions as well. So <clears throat> how are you using APIs to implement a digital strategy? What elements of this do you care about? Or why do APIs matter in this, in this context? Why do they matter? Uh, wh why are you guys getting acquired? <laughs> uh, well, I mean, I can, I can talk a little bit about um, the trends we saw at Apogee. So um, in about 2013, I joined Apogee, and the use case for APIs, we heard a lot from companies, you know, Glo Global 2000 companies was, we need mobile apps, and this makes it a lot more efficient, easier to build mobile apps. Mm -hmm. um, by 2015, 2016, um, you were reading about platform businesses and Harvard Business Review, Gartner was talking about it, Forrester was talking about it, and companies were saying, actually, we need to build
build a platform business model, a digital platform, um, which looks different in different industries. I mean, Walgreens has like a, an ecosystem that's grown up around its app. Um, and the capabilities that it offers to do things like print photos. Um, Allstate has spun out uh, a company that actually sells um, traffic data. So as an insurance company, they, were, they had people voluntarily sending them traffic data because they got a discount on car insurance. And now they have this data set about predicting safe driving habits that um, other companies can use. So APIs became the mechanism to not just be more efficient with your own development teams, but to um, enable third parties um, whether that was an open ecosystem or an inviting ecosystem to you know, mash up products and services and create uh, something new. Hang on, I want to come back to open versus closed systems as well. Pretty interesting. So other, other thoughts on why these things matter? I mean, for us, it's, it's much like you were saying that the uh, mobile is huge mm -hmm. and being able to get to any device anywhere through an API is enormous. Um, it's also allowed us to uh, get more efficient in terms of like just caching. It sounds so mundane, but you might have a API that's relatively heavy, heavy load, but changes frequently, and you want to cache that separately from the smaller payloads of like a user data that changes slowly, uh, that's not as cacheable. So it's been key for us in just not only just the bill, but reaching our customers like everywhere. So not just mobile, but you know over time, you know we want to be like the Netflix of sports, where you're on. You know, potentially a Roku or an Xbox or a you know, PlayStation, and having a core API to build new tools on has been huge for us. Yeah, I think that the uh, the patterns that we have have observed at Programmable Web uh, generally narrow down to one of four motivations. Um, aside from the you know what we've just heard here, one of them is more of the technical argument, which is you know we're hearing a little bit about. The, 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 the decoupling of front ends from back ends, the way that can um, more efficiently drive your, your mobile interfaces and, and invite other developers to build. Uh, the, the idea of um, decomposing a, a monolith into smaller microservices that then uh, can be recomposed into something more compelling and, and, and at a faster rate. You know, this is a, they often talk about agility. So that's one thing, the technical argument. The other one is the financial argument which is that once you've decomposed your enterprise into these uh, smaller parts, um, you, have a lot, you have many more options in terms of um, how to drive those parts. You know, it, it, oftentimes, may, I don't know how many people in this room have heard what, what's called the contract, but when you have an API consumer, like a, like a piece of software consuming an API, they have agreed on a technical contract of how that information is going to or functionality will pass between the two. Once that contract is locked and loaded, um, the consumer and the provider can make all kinds of changes on either side of that contract without disrupting the contract in ways that might financially benefit the organization. So an example of that would be, um, I'm running a mainframe right now. We've put an API around it. Front ends are talking to it. But it costs me $3 million or $4 million a year just for the licensing fees for that mainframe when I can get the same thing done with, uh, in, the in, in the Amazon or Google Cloud, right, and for significantly less money. So now, you know, we hear oftentimes about the, uh, what I think you talked about the market cap improving by 4%, but that's achievable by one of two means, driving more revenue and margin or reducing costs. And so the APIs present um, a big opportunity to uh, reduce costs. The third argument uh, that we see is what we call government compelled. So the government is compelling you in some, re in some way uh, to put APIs in place. It could be true, for example, if you look, follow what's happening um, on the, uh, the health and human services front, they're very much driving the healthcare, the EHR vendors, electronic health record vendors, to um, standardize on sets of APIs that allow all the different EHR systems to interoperate, interoperate in a way that is better for the patient, uh, gives you a better 360 degree view of the patient, and drives further cost out of the healthcare system. And fourth is just for the better, betterment of the world. So we see organizations that are taking, uh, a good example would be the uh, various telecommunications provider, providers in Southeast Asia suddenly realize that within all of the data that they're maintaining, like cell tower data, um, they could actually mine that data using artificial intelligence to spot patterns when there's something like a tsunami so that people don't uh, end up running to where they're going to die as opposed to running to where they're going to save their lives. So they realized they had this data that was life-saving. There was no financial motivation there. It was just to save lives. So th those are essentially the four kind of main buckets that, uh, and patterns that we see when people move to APIs. 
That's a fascinating example. Let me add yeah. one piece of gloss that was okay. fascinating in our data. Um, and I'd love to hear your explanations as well. So in the, in the growth, it's, it, one is productivity gains or cost cutting, so revenue gain. A third one that we actually observed in the data that was very interesting is business stealing. You can actually get market share, uh, not just revenues. You may be taking business from competitors as another element of that. Mm -hmm. So another element, again, why? Yeah, uh, so I just want to talk about the, uh, the uh, use case in, uh, so at IBM and then before that at Pitney Bowes, I did the same, you know, two companies that, uh, I'll say born before Google and Amazon, right, as examples. Um, when you're trying to adapt to modern digital marketing and, mo and digital experience management um, methods, uh, all of that data that drives personalization and drives the robustness of the data set to run marketing automation, to drive personalization on your website or mobile apps, it's all buried in legacy systems. Now the problem is legacy systems weren't really made to be directly communicating right to the glass or to the app. So, Having this API strategy allows you to really drive whatever transformation agenda you have by extracting the data you need from, from, from the bowels of your backend um, infrastructure, but making it in a very uh, highly repeatable um, uh, process that allows the front end of marketing or the customer service organization to actually deliver that experience to the customer without having you know, all of the uh, expense and the timeline of uh, you know, a fully um, you know, monolithic type application. So that was one of the things that really helped drive the uh, you know, modernized customer experience. So um, David, you said something really interesting that we should get it, uh, make sure everyone's on the same page. You mentioned contracts as an API. What is an API? <laughs> <laughs> How much time do we have? <laughs> um, well, so, uh, okay. so what is one? So, so, so uh, first of all, uh, again, as I said earlier, I'm not I'm trying to get more traffic, but we, we actually wrote a, a whole series that addresses what is an API and why do they matter. Um, in a nutshell, uh, as I said, um, an API is, uh, generally speaking, when you read like Forbes or one of these other publications, they'll say APIs are, ha are the way that software, <laughs> one piece of software talks to another piece of software. It's a bit of an oversimplification, but there's plenty of truth to that. Um, the, forever, um, this is not new, by the way. API has been around since before I even I, I got into computer science back when I was in college. It's just that they've changed a lot over the years. Um, uh, and, and so they are ways for, for software to talk to each other. And generally speaking, it's through some form of, a, a, of an agreement between the two about how they're going to share and transfer information and functionality to one another. That's called a contract. If you study API documentation, there's very, there are very clear uh, articulations of, oh, if you want uh, the customer ID, then this is what you, this is the, uh, the command you actually have to send over the wire to the system that has the customer ID in order for the customer, that system to respond with the ID. And when it comes back, it's going to look like this. Well, all of those specifics are the contract. And, um, and you know, we could talk about it for hours. The, 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 probably the most important thing is, is that over the last four decades, the nature of these contracts has changed. And one of the most important things that I'd like to leave you with is, is that um, the nature of the contracts will continue to change um, for the foreseeable future. You know, we keep hearing, oh, you know, this is it. We found the, the utopia of these contracts. It's, it's called REST, or before that it was called Web Services, and then before that it was XML per, uh, RPC, and before that it was CORBA. And every time one of these technologies comes along, that's sort of like a, a standard way of expressing these contracts and integrating systems. Everybody says, okay, we're done. And then, bingo. Somebody like Google comes along and says, well, wait, wait, we've got this thing, cool thing called gRPC, and that changes all the rules. You know, Before, you, could, uh, you couldn't even stream data, but now you can stream it bidirectionally. And, and so, so the rules are changing, but the, the contract is really that understanding between the consumer of the API and the provider of the API. And the other important thing to remember about that contract is, is that um, you know, that we've learned as the API economy has matured is, is that you have to be very careful about breaking it, just like a legal breaking of the contract. If you're an API provider and you decide to change one little piece of the contract without warning the consumers of that API, then there's a pretty much a 100% chance that all the applications and consumers of that API will break as soon as you, you, you've broken the contract. In other words, the application will stop working. And the, probably the best example we have of that happened a couple weeks ago when in response to the Cambridge Analytica Facebook uh, fiasco, 
um, Facebook woke up one morning and said, okay, we've been like, giving, providing all this data through our API, guess what? Not anymore. And without warning, they just basically shut down um, a very large percentage of their API, which broke tons of applications just instantly. But they made a business decision that in the uh, interests of uh, their users' privacy, that that was just the right thing to do, and developers were just going to have to suck it up. Uh, anyone else want to add some uh, further definitions or nuance to that to that definition so far? I think I would I would add I think um, you know one of the things we want to talk about was what's changed in the last few years. So I think um, without you know diving too far into the technical weeds, the implementation of an API. So a lot of you may have signed on with Google or signed on with Facebook right to a website. So the implementation of that sign-on functionality is a service, so not some big giant application that's like embedded in Gmail, but like a separate thing that other developers can use to call. Um, what's changed over the last few years is, you know, you can build these services as microservices that are horizontally scalable, right? So if you can do it on any of the big clouds, including ours, um, uh, and and so as a as a service. If, for some example, you have a Pokemon Go moment where you know your your app is adopted like like Gangbusters, um, that service can actually be scaled out, you know, automatically. Um, so the opportunity, your ability to ad adapt to opportunities uh, from a technical standpoint, if you adopt this sort of API service-centric architecture, is much greater. It's easier to do than it was in the past. Um, but I think that um, that technical side of things actually raises the ante to David's point on the business side of things. Because you know, what if this thing you're offering to the world is adopted by tens or hundreds of thousands of people or organizations? Well, then changing the terms under which they can access it becomes a really big deal. Um, so you know, we always talk about, your, internally as well as externally, your, an API is a product. You are a product owner as a development team or as a product management team. And you have to think about it as if it were a real product. So I want to highlight something that's buried in the definition that Brian and David gave you that's actually really important. So as a contract, an API is also a permissioning system. What's often missed in the Forbes definition of just software talking to software is that folks often relegate it to a technology low-level decision. Once you recognize it's actually a contract, a permissioning system, it becomes an element of strategy because you're now saying who else outside your ecosystem gains access to your ecosystem. And that's a really important additional development in what these things do. So that contract element is actually essential. It's not just a level technology, it's also essential to strategy. That would actually lead to another of these questions about, so what should be open and what should be closed? I don't yeah. want to take that. Open and close is always a tough one because the challenge is once you've opened it to the world, that contract, like to everyone's point, it's locked in. And when you change it, uh, you, it, it's slow. You have to like drain off your previous users. You've lost a lot of flexibility. So I, I don't know, my advice for people trying this out is try internal APIs until you really feel confident and have some expertise before opening them up because the ability to change once they're out is very difficult. Um, so the other thing I would say is the things you want to open are the things that really add a competitive advantage. Like for us, it's supporting our ecosystem of tool vendors. Um, whereas in some cases, like access to uh, our actual contest data, you know, for regulatory requirements, we can't. Um, so being a regulated industry, we have to be sensitive to that. So if you're in a regulated space, um, you need to make sure that you're opening things up with the right permissioning level. Like, uh, to your point, that like it's that authorization, that permissioning is super important. So, um, am so I free to commit suicide up here? Well, I'll, I'll, yeah. I have Harry Carey. <laughs> <laughs> so, Programmable Web, as I said, it runs the world's largest directory of public APIs. We don't have record of many internal ones. So, if everybody in this room, I don't, how many people do you think are here? Maybe seventy-five with that. Yeah. Uh, if everybody in this room were to create an API, a public API, and put it into our directory, it would add to our mojo, right? Like that would be great. All right, seventy-five new APIs in our directory, and if there was ten SDKs for each one of those, that's another seven hundred and fifty assets. Great. Let's go. For, let's go with it. Problem is, is that 
um, again, looking on the patterns that we've observed over the last you know, 10 years, is that we just keep seeing the same mistake getting made over and over again, speaking to the, to the point being made here, is, is that a lot of companies hear this uh, kind of idea, oh, if I build it, they will come. <coughs> Right? Naturally, I'm going, to build, I'm going to put an API out there in the public space, and a bunch of developers are going to come that I, don't, I never met them before, and they're going to, build, they're going to in, come up with some innovation that I never thought of. So yeah, that's, that's some serious Kool-Aid right there. As a matter of fact, <laughs> as a matter of fact I would say, you, you know, watch my drink yeah, very, yeah. very rarely does that actually play out that way. And, and in fact, more often than not, what ends up happening is the companies that kind of embraced that idea and like jumped on it because they saw it at some conference and everybody, people were saying, yeah, you just go out and build these APIs, they end up regretting that decision like in spades. And then what ends up happening is they end up pulling back. What are the examples of this? Well, Netflix is probably the most, uh, most talked about example where they, they put out a public API, all kinds of developers came, it just created more headaches for them in terms of the overload of you know, support. It, they didn't think about it in terms of a product. And they suddenly realized none of these people are adding value to our business. So let's dial it back and focus on the partners that, and ourselves, our own internal stuff, and our own architecture, make it more efficient in a way that drives value for our business. So they focus on companies like Nintendo and PlayStation that have, the, the, um, that have huge you know, numbers of users and uh, represent great opportunities to put a Netflix client on. ESPN. Same thing. Edmunds, car company, same thing. I just told you about Facebook dialing back their APIs. LinkedIn. I mean, these co tons of these companies, for whatever reason, you know, they were very gung-ho about putting an API out in the public space, and then they pulled it back. So my, my recommendation, based on those patterns, is exactly what we just heard, which is start off, get your sea legs under you in terms of working internally, figure out and get to understand how API ecosystems work. Build your own API economy. Uh, first, then maybe identify some partners that would be good to work with who could drive some value for your business, open to them exclusively. Obviously, you have this permissioning system in that prevents anybody else from randomly accessing it. And then only then, if you think there's a real compelling reason to make the API publicly available, then by all means, go for it. But be prepared because there's a whole bunch of new issues that come along with that decision, not the least of which is you have to run it just like you would run any product that your company puts in the public space. Uh, the problem with David is every answer leads to three new cool questions. So I'm going to have... Uh, uh, I'm, I'm going to have... Uh, so what you've anticipated some other really wonderful things I wanted to delve into. One of these, so when do you not open APIs? We had an interesting example with uh, Facebook dialing back, with Netflix opening up. What's a rule? How do you know when not to open an API? Pretty much always. No. <laughs> yeah. I, I was going to say, unless you have a very compelling use case and a okay. hypothesis yeah. of why something should be public, don't make it public. Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, I, I would offer as a test, like, can you think about a developer community getting excited about this API? Mm -hmm. right? like, and, and it could be a small community. I mean, it could be sort of a medical imaging API where it's not a million people, but it's still a group of people mm -hmm. who we get excited about it. So you know, we're, we're you know, Google, pretty well-known brand, pretty high credibility among developers. Like, we have lots of developer advocates. And their job is to go out, engage with communities, and convince them to try our, our tools and our APIs. So if we need developer advocates, you're going to want developer advocates for your APIs. So, you know, and you can, do, you can do tests, right? Send people out to talk to developers. Like, go to conferences, go to meetups, and chat with folks about what would be interesting. Um, you know, developers are highly opinionated. They will, they will certainly yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you're, you're, you're familiar share what they think of the idea. You're familiar with Bezos Envy, right? Yes. Uh -huh. Be Bezos. I mean, a lot of people envy Bezos because he's got the most money in the world, right? He's the richest guy in the world. But, but the other reason that a lot of people have uh, Jeff Bezos envy is because um, he famously uh, put together a, uh, a memo um, more than a decade ago that basically told, I'm not going to go through the, the, all the different points of the memo, but in, to give you the TLDR, too long didn't read, uh, it basically said, if you don't figure out a way to, uh, to break down what you're doing into composable elements into these like microservices and then make them available on our network internally in a way that everybody can reuse them and then and that there's only one of them like we don't need 10 zip code checkered checkers you're fired right now you have to remember that the motivation for him doing that was he's lived through the world where um, where uh, enterprises build big monolithic infrastructures and he saw how that just killed them 
from both a agility point of view and a cost point of view. Because once you have these things, they're impossible to maintain. It takes five years to get anything done. He saw the, the benefits of speed and agility and cost reduction. Um, he didn't say make part of that wasn't, OK, once we do that, we're going to make them all available to the public. right? But he probably knew that was coming next. So the, the, that's the dirty little secret, is the focus was getting it right internally before they got it right externally. Yes. Yeah. And then what followed was, wait a minute, we just built this really cool thing, you know, like EC2. Uh, maybe we should make that available to some, uh, some folks on the outside and see what happens. And now it's one of the fastest growing components of Amazon's business. And it's extraordinary how that's opened up. For, for those of you, the stuff that David's uh, talking about, if you will look it up, it's the Yegi rant, Y-E-G-G-E -G -G -E, rant. It's a beautiful description of how these systems work and how Bezos has actually really done this, uh, done this well. So some of the things I'm hearing about is so if it's complexity, you need to open when there's a rich soil or something for developers to dig into and build upon. Um, recapitulating from some interviews from some of you guys earlier, one I did hear about when you might not do it is what you usually want to build them when you do want to encourage experimentation. It's risky to build them when you don't want to encourage experimentation. For example, don't open APIs on pacemakers. You'll kill people, <laughs> right? So yeah. think when experimentation is good. Think of when experimentation is bad. And those are things that you, you know, or nuclear power plants. Yeah, don't necessarily want to open those APIs either. So there are a couple of elements there uh, to do that. I just wanted to add one thing, tying the, going back to the contract, the concept of the contract, in the concept, I think everyone's saying, get it right internally before you expose it to the world. But one of the, another use case that if you are working for a company that acquires a lot of other companies, right, and you know how long it takes to do all of the integrations on the back end, and when you're trying to get a faster go to market in terms of a unified product set or a unified brand, the concept of the API is, is not only the, the contract elements, but it's, I think it's a business discipline that creates standards in the organization. So one of the things that we focused, we spent a lot of time on in when standing up IBM's e-commerce marketplace was the concept of these entities, like what is a product? What is a service? What is the definition of the product? And it went all the way from the description to the content to the pricing structure. And when we had an acquisition that came in and said, well, this is my description of a product, and we said, that's nice, this is our description of a product, <laughs> so you map, you do the mapping accordingly. So I, I just want to, you know, I think one of the whole things on here, yes, there's a technical component, but I think there's a whole business discipline that can really streamline and accelerate, especially in those use cases of integration. I just want to point out one thing. We're also leaving out one important component of the API economy here. We're kind of focused on the digital transformation piece here, uh, you know, we're talking about all the reasons an organization should do this. We're leaving out the, the other thing. H how many people in this room have heard the word outsourcing? <laughs> <laughs> right? So there's a, a, form, a part of the API economy which is all about outsourcing, right? So Stripe is an example of a company that will completely take all the friction and pain out of running your payments for you, right? It's this equivalent of outsourcing to a company in India only the, instead of dealing with people, you're just outsourcing through an API. And in those cases where you feel like you have an idea that could be the next kind of outsourcing possibility to, you know, like a Stripe or a Twilio or a Nexmo or a DocuSign, where you have some functionality that organizations might want to outsource to, and then what ends up happening is your company becomes nothing but the API. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's an important, so, so there, you have to open it up, right? Like if that's, if you are going to be, if you see yourself, if you view yourself as a potential outsourcing target, um, somebody that, that another company would outsource to, then at, the, at that point, you should be thinking of yourselves as a platform and the API as the means of getting access to that platform. Ah, so how do, so this ties into a number of different areas. How do APIs help you build platforms? It goes to choice of partners. It goes to what you're opening. How do you use APIs to build platforms? All platforms are nothing but a collection of APIs to begin with. If you look at Windows, Linux, um, anything, they're, they're just, they're, they're nine, 5% of it's the user interface and the other 95% is big, pretty much APIs working under the hoods, there's, but they're a system APIs. When they put APIs out on the web back in 2005, that turned the web into a programmable platform. So if you're a business, mm -hmm. then the way you kind of uh, set your business up as a platform is you publish 
you know, a bunch of APIs that, that, that just represent your platform and your system. I think the other piece is once you've opened up APIs for different tools and different people to come in and participate, suddenly your ecosystem of, of your platform starts to build. So like for us, like various uh, media companies, various uh, tool providers, like once the API is built for them, then th this starts to expand our reach and expand our platform and it becomes a, a big chunk of what we're doing. So to your point, like your internal platform, the APIs help access your internal users and then outward it uh, it helps the ecosystem and you become a, pl a platform onto yourself. Yeah. And, and I think the, the concept of permissionless innovation mm -hmm. and modularity, I think is very powerful. So, I mean, I, I've used this example of, of Walgreens and Apogee customer because it's so much something I wouldn't have thought of, like, you know, steeped in platforms from the software world for decades. But, you know, they have photo printers in their stores. So in order to build their own mobile app, they put an API around those photo printers so you could print from the Walgreens app. They gradually, you know, first they experimented, but then they gradually opened it up to a public API, and you could get a revenue share if you printed from your app to their, um, to their um, uh, photo, photo printer. There are enough Walgreens stores that besides, you know, there are big partnerships with apps, you know, we all know, this little ecosystem of startups actually grew up to do sort of like clever, cool things and different types of, you know, cards and calendars. And, you know, none of these things is monumental, but, you know, they have 8,000 stores. So it's enough that you had these little startups, you know, that would be small businesses um, that never would have existed without this API opportunity. So, you know, at, at, you know, there are big platforms like Windows and Linux, and, you know, then there's like the Walgreens photo printers they're, they're on platform because <laughs> yeah. exactly right. so I've another way I've just heard APIs described is a great system for permissionless innovation and it's actually really interesting and important idea people you don't know are bringing you ideas you don't have and these are innovations on your ecosystem that can be incredibly valuable and APIs are the technology to help you do that and uh, do you have other examples of that at DraftKings or at IBM uh, where people you don't know have brought you ideas you don't have, or have brought new partners that you didn't anticipate. I think the most fun we had was the uh, Cardinals Stadium. It was like, boy, we'd really like to showcase uh, fantasy points on our scoreboard. Um, and you know, you know, we thought about it very loosely, but just having them kind of cold reach out to us, it's like, hey, we've been looking at your fantasy uh, API. We kind of reverse engineer what you're doing your mobile apps. You know, can we use this? Uh, and we're like. That's great. Um, so, <laughs> so we get to use, uh, you know, getting that visibility out in the public is uh, pretty exciting. Can you give an example of a failure? Oh, please. We, we want successes and, and good Harvard Business School yeah. cases have both. You know, yeah, as you can tell, and yeah. the failure. As you can tell, I'm a little bit of a cynic when it comes to some of this stuff, even though I love it. Um, to me, one of the things you hear about, particularly with mobile applications, is that it's a way to continue to engage your customers, right? You know, create some sort of some form of enduring engagement. I don't know that's necessarily a failure, but uh, how many people live in Massachusetts or the New England area? So, every, so everybody here has heard, heard of Jordan's, right? Furniture, Jordan's. Furniture. So my wife and I were in Jordan's Furniture over the weekend buying, what do you buy at Jordan's? A mattress, right? Like, you know, <laughs> 55 mattresses, they all feel the same after something. Anyway, uh, it also, we, uh, just serendipitously, we didn't know this, happened to be the last day that you could, whatever you buy at Jordan's, if the Red Sox throw a no-hitter after July 17th, you get all your money back, right? <laughs> Everything's free. It, yes. and, and so, you know, I'm, as I'm processing all this, I'm thinking, where's the app? Mm. <laughs> Where the hell is the app that's on my phone that's telling me whether the Red Sox are about to throw a no-hitter or not, keeping me engaged? Right in a way that, like, I'm excited. Like, we spent a lot of money on that mattress. It's actually like a. It was kind of like a gamble. Now, now I'm, I'm, you know, I'm literally gambling on the Red Sox, hoping to get my get my money back. And but, like, how? Like, I gotta now. I gotta like go on the web every day and kind of, you know, I I want an app that's telling me, boy, it's the bottom of the eighth, and the Red Sox are about to. Hit. You know, it's seven nothing, and uh, another inning of this, and you know, some commentary or something keep me engaged. Because guess what? While I'm looking at that, Jordan's is sending me other, other engaging messages. I, 
So I went on to Jordan. I think, he, I think we've created a DraftKings customer. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So, so I, I, went, I went on to Jordan's website. I did, it's a true story. I went on Jordan's website. And I was like, where's the contact the corporate offices? I wanted to call him up about this idea. If anyone you take this idea, I'm going to crush. No. And, and I, wanted, I wanted to contact them and say, hey, I got this. Like, you guys are missing out on the benefits of the API economy and mobile and engaging. And where's your digital strategy? There's no contact information. <laughs> Zero. Like, only if you're a customer and you want like, to follow up on an order. But if you want to call like, you know, the corner office and say, hey, um, it's sort of like permissionless yep. development. I just want to call in and say, I've got this really killer idea for you. Let me tell you about it, and then go have fun with it. And when you're ready, give me the app so I can tell. So if I win, I know. Um, you know, it also have the amount of money that's at risk. And I mean, so, so complete fail, if you ask me. Like, they're missing out on an opportunity to, to uh, engage their audience. And so obviously, APIs would play a, an absolute fundamental role in, in the rollout of that kind of. Uh, yeah, I'm afraid I've dropped far too much at Jordan's in the last couple of weeks on exactly those issues. So, I, I'm so very, you're a gambler I'm too, then. I'm very <laughs> sympathetic uh, to do that. Although, maybe if you called up and said you're about to buy a Satva mattress, then they'd take your call. Right. So uh, you're a compulsive gambler. Is it's, it. gotten to, it's gotten yeah. out of hand. We just bought a new house, so that's uh, um, too much time spent at Jordan's on that. So. Um, what are your biggest challenges in implementing API strategy? What have been some of the, the biggest hurdles uh, to get them off the ground? I can tell you a couple. Uh, so uh, one of the challenges we had was um, putting a ring fence around funding. So APIs, at least in our you know, scenario, require dipping into back end, dipping into you know, maybe the CRM platform is owned by one budget in the company. The ERP system is owned by a different part. Uh, the digital engagement metrics and all that other stuff is, you know, so the issue of a lot of these things, you're trying to create a, 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 a specific user journey or a customer journey, uh, isolating where the data comes from, but then having the complete supply chain of developers and all the funding across all the departments in order to actually develop, not only just to get it out the door, but to the point of, you then need to, pro you need a product management uh, you know, structure over it, because these are everlasting, these contracts live for a long time, you have change management, releases, and all that. So I think, to me, again, in the, in the construct of a large enterprise where you've got different cost centers and different technical organizations, that uh, is, was one of the biggest hurdles to get over. I think for us, it was uh, getting the fractious set of developers to agree on the standards. <laughs> like, I mean, it sounds silly, but like, is it a 403 or a 404? Uh, is it contest or contest? Uh, and kind of getting everybody in agreements, that's, it's, it's kind of how you communicate across your organization, so those things actually matter a great deal. Um, but everyone's got an opinion. Um, and so working through, like, how are you going to do paging? How are you going to do caching? You know, uh, the kind of the, the little technical details, just, you know, what I would recommend, which we didn't do initially, is actually put a small committee together with the authority to just define it. You know, seek input and then define it. Uh, we made the mistake of making it too broad and allowing too many people to have an opinion, and then we had to, like, pull back that authority, uh, and that was very difficult. So getting a committee together that's really focused on the standards and how people communicate quickly, I think, is uh, important. Yeah, we, we, uh, I remember uh, uh, being in the room with a CTO of an airline, and he had all his leads in this kind of summit about how they moved to API-centric architecture. And he started off, he, this is not a Jeff Bezos, this is a much nicer person. Uh, uh, he started off and he said, we have to build things that people want and like to use. And you know, that is a shift in mindset um, and in the organizational support. So I completely agree, agree with Rudy. If you want your developers to build things people want and like to use, you have to give them the support and the time and the, you know, the ability to do documentation and to maintain the code and you know, treat it as a living thing. Um, and so we talk a lot uh, in, inside Google about the social consequences of your code. Like, your colleagues are going to use your code. The people we hire two or three years or five years from now are probably going to use your code. You know, a partner is going to use their code. These are human beings. 
Um, and I think there's this, you know, a, a myth, a completely inaccurate myth about like coding alone in a closet is like, you know, the best engineer in the world. Absolutely not. The best engineers understand the social implications of everything they do. I was just in uh, Germany speaking uh, at Daimler's headquarters, and um, it was they had an internal uh, API event just for the company. Uh, Daimler is a Fortune 25 company, and um, one of the things that most impressed me uh, about that company was that uh, part of the event they had uh, their chief marketing officer and their chief financial officer on stage as a show of like support and <laughs> complete understanding for the transformational power that APIs could represent to Daimler as a company in terms of maybe moving their ca market cap forward or whatever. They totally understood how APIs uh, from internal digital transformation to uh, connected vehicles and stuff like that could transform the entire company. Another company in Europe, also a Fortune 25 company, uh, came to Programmable Web. They went through API University and everything and they said, we need your help. And I sat down with them, and one of the things they said, and I think this speaks a little bit to your point, which was, I, I, I was able to get out of them. I said, do you have corner office executive backing? And they said, no, that's something we don't have. And I said, well, you're in trouble already. Right? You're not going to get the sweeping transformation across this company unless, it's, unless you've got the backing of the corner office. Big challenge. I literally introduced them to the guys at Daimler so they could learn from Daimler how, they, how Daimler got the, 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 the corporate backing. So that's one big challenge. You've got to have that. The second one, I think, speaks to what you were saying, uh, is security. So just keep in mind that um, the biggest companies in the world, some of them here, Google, uh, Facebook, Apple, uh, uh, Microsoft, all the, the biggest companies in the world who can afford to spend the most amount of money on the best talent for the very best security people, uh, Pinterest, uh, Instagram, which is part of Facebook, have all had some very public API security problems. Now, in some cases, they didn't turn into a disaster. In other cases, they did, right? Like with Apple, you know, there were some very revealing pictures of, uh, of uh, celebrities that got out there as a result of the lack of what's called rate limiting on the Find My iPhone API. So um, the point being that if these companies who can afford the very best talent can't get it completely locked down, then what does that mean for the rest of us, right, who can't afford that talent? So just be aware that security is going to be the biggest, I think in my, next to executive backing, probably tied, the two biggest challenges are, are those two. One's technical, one is cultural or slash organizational, but you cannot overlook either of those two things or, or, um, or underestimate the importance of them. So, so having identified these wonderful challenges, executive leadership support and security holes, what are your solutions to addressing those challenges? How have you gone about fixing them? We've invested a lot in our denial of service protection, a lot in our rate limiting. Um, our, we have our machine learning team spending a lot of time looking for weird patterns to block people. Um, kind of the, the operational overhead of once these are out in the wild <coughs> is not small. You'll be amazed at how many Chinese IPs are hitting your site at the end of the day. Uh, um, so it, it definitely requires a change in mindset when it's op open out to the world. But like <coughs> maturing your operations is critical. And, and, and the ecosystem, again, something that's changed, um, the ecosystem has evolved. So there are more tools and services, whether that's from you know, the big cloud providers or you, know, you mentioned ML. So you know, over the last uh, five years or so, you know, Apogee has been applying machine learning to its traffic from um, Apogee customers, so detecting patterns so it can do some preventative you know, throttling and security. So you know, if you're a big company or a digital native, you may have your own ML folks. Um, if you're not, you, there are you know, tools, services you know, um, like that that you can like, use you know, as a consumer, right? So you have SaaS tools that you can piggyback on, on the work of other companies. Those tools are growing so fast, too. Yeah. Like, yes. I, I don't know that we would build that ourselves now just in yeah. the change of two years. Yeah. The, the other thing is some agreement, is monitoring the standards that get you to a secure place are very important. So you know, when you think about today, with these APIs, Somebody mentioned the word mashups earlier. You know, what, what, what we're really talking about is these l large application networks like 
like SAP connected to Salesforce, connected to, you know, I mean, all the, that's, that's an application network. And the problem is, is that if, as the, as the uh, mashup grows exponentially larger, if there's not some fundamental agreement on the standards that are being put in place to secure the whole thing, that by itself becomes a huge challenge. And so what I always tell people is make sure you monitor the standard space because every time some other thing pops up that's like a vulnerability in, in the existing standards, the various standards bodies like the ITF race to shut it down with another, you know, with some other standards. So an example would be the IETF um, uh, realized that the, that the, uh, the whole, what they call the OAuth workflow was lacking what they call proof of possession, that, that you should have a token that represents, that essentially represents a, your credentials. Now we have a new standard that proves that you are the rightful possessor of that token and can use it to, to get into some system. Um, as organizations, you need to stay on top of those things so that you can, as you build your application networks, you can impress upon all the other players in those networks that they need to get up to up to snuff and up to speed on on them so that you're all secure as secure as you possibly can be. So uh, I was going to throw out a couple of wacky questions on how APIs interact with machine learning or how they might interact with blockchain, but I wanted to open it up to the audience because we have a couple of minutes left to make sure you get your questions answered from this panel of experts. So if you have a moment, just raise your hand, and I'm delighted to call on you just for purposes of video. Uh, I'll, you know, please ask the question, and if it's uh, unclear at all, I'll try to rephrase it so that everyone else can hear. So, yes. Uh, so, uh, the day after tomorrow, uh, the European Union will uh, come in for the GDPR, uh, protection, uh, data protection. Uh, but uh, we also see that some companies uh, consider to implement GDPR in a global respect. Microsoft Cloud, Facebook. So just, just to recapitulate for video land, so GDPR on data privacy is being implemented in Europe, and so what's this mean for uh, API implementation uh, and, and data privacy? I, I actually think um, APIs will be very helpful in helping companies deal with it. I mean, it's essentially creating a market demand um, so you mentioned some of the big players, you know, have started to build services, cloud services to help companies do this. I think we'll see more of that. Um, you know, this is not GDPR specific, but it is my absolute favorite Google product, which is totally nerdy. Um, we actually have an API that uses machine learning to do auto redaction. So you can run a stream of data through this API, and it's smart enough to recognize credit card numbers and social security numbers, and it will auto redact this. So if you're sharing, you know, data with some business partner, Partner, but you can't share that level of, of privacy, you know, you can just build that into your, your application. So that I think you'll see a bunch of different, you know, potentially very specialized services, you know, available as software as a service to help help companies do this. I'm in sort of a unique position because I run one of those websites that has personal information in it. So I'm subject to GDPR, right? General Data Protection Regulation, uh, which is Europe based, right? Um, uh, but then also I have to understand what the role of APIs in that is, right? So, interestingly enough, like, first of all, GDPR is very ambiguous. Mm -hmm. Depending on which lawyers you talk to, mm -hmm. you're going to get different, like, set of punch lists of things you have to do as a website operator <coughs> to comply and not get hit with, like, a $20 million fine. Um, the, one of the areas of ambiguity is the uh, traceability of transactional uh, data. For example, um, uh, you come to my, you come to Programmable Web, uh, you, you, uh, you sign up as a user, and then that data ends up somewhere else. Now, we don't resell our data, but let's say it did. How do you, when that other company contacts you, according to, according to some interpreta interpretations of GDPR, you should be able to find out how they got, you, got your information, right? Well, they got it from Programmable Web, right? Well, okay, uh, like, you should, be able to, you should be, be able to know that. At least that's some interpretations of GDPR. APIs actually play a group, can, an API led architecture can play a great role in that sort of kind of audit trail uh, on sourcing data. So, for example, every time data moves from one application to another in your application network, let's say it goes from, you know, through, through an API, an API is kind of like a turnstile. If you, go to, if you go to Fenway Park, you go to these other places, turnstile is always that, that, that opportunity to kind of do a check, right? 
So you can imagine that maybe some of these third-party solutions we're talking about are, um, are starting to kind of record new bits and pieces of information, for example, the origins of the data, so that that audit trail is in, in, in place and somebody, anybody in this room can sort of like figure out, well, what was the origin of this information? How did company X get something that I gave to company Y? And so uh, that, there's, there's an opportunity there um, to, for, to, to kind of satisfy the requirements of GDPR that a, the, an API-led architecture naturally kind of solves. I, I, yeah, like I, I can't believe I'm going to be the blockchain guy, but I'll go there. Like that actually could be an application of yeah, blockchain. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's great. Yeah, in oh. fact, that's people are working on that exact issue with blockchain. That's exactly right. So, other questions? Um, yes. So interesting. So to recapitulate, recapitulate the question, um, so for APIs, you made a standardization of what are the assets for the loans, for the identification, for the accounts, each of these things. Is there some place to look that up? That, that sounds like a great challenge for a programmable web, a, a public, a public <laughs> library uh, um, of those kinds of assets. Various industries are getting together to kind of standardize on, on taxonomies like that, um, you know, field names. Uh, Google actually plays a pretty good role in that in that space. They they, they actually came up with this idea of a mobile API um, that all the telecommunications providers um, conform to for portability of like your data from one telecom if you decide to switch from like T-Mobile to AT&T or something like that. So um, you know uh, there there's uh, there's that right. The industry is just getting together, realizing that all boats float higher if they all get into solve that problem together. And uh, the other one is, is to look at that's sort of nascent, but there's some activity there. Some of it's good, some of it's kind of just dangling as a schema.org. Um, I don't know if, you know, and it's, it's, it's a more, it's, a lot of things are Google things, but are open too, like complete, like, like more, more open than Google, but Google's kind of the ones that uh, drove schema.org. And, and in there, there are some standard taxonomies, um, like for recipes, you know, uh, and so all the recipe sites conform to that. And uh, um, Google has some leverage there because it has to do with the searchability, you know, SEO and page rank. But, but point being is, is that there is some work being done in those spaces. It's, uh, it's just a question of where you find it. Like, you know, is it a more of an open source schema.org thing or is, or is the industry getting together to solve the problem? Okay, question? Well, actually, DHSS didn't actually design the API and drive the industry to it. They asked the industry to come up with it themselves, right? However, there was a little twist there. Like, if you didn't, if you didn't cooperate, then you, you weren't allowed to participate in Medicare and Medicaid, which was like, <laughs> 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 So they, they were twisting some arms. A better example of that is the Blue Button API, where, um, the, where NIST, which is an agent, a government agency, actually designed a standard API that all um, uh, energy uh, companies, like you know, local energy companies, have to comply with, and and the reason for that is is that um, most of the data that energy companies keep about us and our consumption is very opaque. We can't really see it. So like if um, somebody came to your front door and said, "Hey, I could save you. I, I, I'm a so I sell solar, and I can save you a ton of money." the data that they would need in order to do the math for you is unavailable. So NIST and you know, the government said that's, not, that's, that's no good. We need to have, that data needs to be unlocked so that to promote competition in the energy business. 
So um, they did all of the hard, heavy lifting of developing the API, which is kind of the hard, one of the hard parts. Mm -hmm. And then they took it out to the energy companies and said, you know, uh, if you don't comply with this, um, well, then your customers just might reject you altogether because you're, you're, you're locking up your da their data. I don't know if that answers the question. I mean, there's, there's, a, there's a whole journey, right, I think that you're touching on that starts with, okay, where's the API coming from? Who's going to build it? Um, particularly when there's government intervention. Uh, right. So I think we have time for one more question. So make it a good one. Uh, and, any no last pressure. questions on there? Said, all right, well, I will assume that that was the best question in the end in that case. <laughs> all right, well, look, this has uh, been a phenomenal panel. Thanks, guys, for doing this. It's an incredible left of uh, detail. Thank you. Thank you.